welcome. I know it is the lull before finals and people have been really busy. And so I appreciate taking the time to be here today. And before we get started, um, I would like to give you a little background about why we're here and how we got here as far as ETS and the um, subject matter of active learning classrooms. Uh, five years ago, the Chancellor made a huge commitment to our general assignment classrooms and funded us for a period of four years to introduce more technology into the classroom as well as look at the physical spaces and we, um, throughout the campus, we, we installed, you know, lights, floors, furnishings, blackboards, a number of those things. So the ball started rolling. We, I think when the program started, we had about 60-some classrooms with technology, and now we're up to approximately 190. So it was a really um, push forward for us to, to keep in pace with our peers as well. Uh, then shortly, sometime in between there, uh, there was this eureka moment where uh, some of us from Berkeley went to the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, and we saw uh, two pilot classrooms, active learning classrooms on their campus. One sat 117, I think the other one was like 40 some seats. And just by chance, Vice Provost Kathy Koshlin and Christina Maslek were also there. And we all came back to the campus and we said, wow, how do we get this started in Berkeley? How do we move this forward? How do we get the interest around active learning classrooms? Then I think also around that time, we saw in the headlines Moffitt Library and we realized opportunity is knocking on the door. They had started a huge campaign for remodeling their facility, and we said we have to include the classrooms. We have four uh, Moffitt classrooms there, and if anybody has taught down there, I don't know if you have, you don't even get phone reception down there. I mean, it's, um, they have technology, but they needed help. So, uh, it was, we started a work group, a work group that was going to look at the Moffitt project. We worked with architects, we interviewed students, faculty, um, we looked at other like campuses to see what they were doing, and we came up with a report um, and recommendations that were fed back to, and, and, and that committee was chaired by Deb Nolan, who just walked in the door. And um, we, we came up with a set of recommendations, and I have them posted around the room. I don't want us to, lo to lose sight of those. So, and then we moved from that. We said, okay, how do we, how do we partner with somebody on campus and pilot this, this concept? And uh, the Department of Statistics said, we're ready to, to go ahead and do this. So working with statistics and working with KI, they are um, a friend of the university. We see a lot of their, their furniture and products all over campus, and they have an educator in their organization, and that's Dr. Martin Wyckoff. So let's welcome him. Oh, and thanks. Thank on. you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Well, thank you all. It's really been a pleasure preparing for this because uh, I hold UC Berkeley in very high esteem. I am a graduate. I'm an alumni of the University of Washington. And so while I do hold you in high esteem for your academics, your football team has another <laughs> issue. But uh, I, I also uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to be here because it gives me an opportunity to kind of go back to my academic roots and share with you uh, some of the research that I've been working on, but also some of the research that I haven't seen for a while. And, um, and that helps us achieve some of the goals for today. So uh, one of the goals for today is to review some of the factors that will promote learning and engagement. And uh, what we'll do is review some of the goals that have been proposed, uh, proffered by various people. And also, I want to provide a historical perspective, which is kind of how I got involved in this, because I kind of, from, I kind of come from that historical perspective. I don't look that old, but I, historically I, I do appreciate the historical value of some of the background for learning uh, processes. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about active learning approaches, and I'll give an overview. Uh, also, 
uh, we have to, of course, consider what can we do from an environmental perspective, from a design perspective, to promote, to support, to facilitate, to engender uh, the, the learning, the act of learning, given, of course, the parameters of budget and design and culture and function. What can we do? And we'll review some of the current approaches to learning space design, uh, some of the evidence, some of the data that is available to support the application of some of those new design approaches. And uh, I'll talk a little bit also about one of the studies that I've been involved in after giving a talk not unlike this at SUNY Albany. They uh, offered uh, uh, the, us an opportunity to do some research because they too were interested in uh, the impact of classroom design on learning. And finally, how do we achieve change? Okay, Brenda has been involved, and a number of you have been involved in accomplishing the change that has to occur in the philosophy of learning, the philosophy of running the institutions, et cetera. To achieve that change, what are the challenges that we have to contend with? And uh, how do we deal with change management? And then we'll have time for questions and discussions. Now, given the size of this group, we can be really active learners. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is participate, discuss. If there's a point or something that you want to discuss, debate, whatever, let's do it. So let's kind of keep this an open forum. It's not like we have uh, a, a lecture hall of 300 people. So this will be great, and, uh, and I think we'll get a lot more out of it, too. And I also want to thank you for this beautiful day. This is, uh, <laughs> I tell you, coming from Green Bay, we had snow last week. And uh, this is a lot different. And so if uh, this was a normal class that I was teaching, I might figure out a way to go outside. Um, of course, if it was a normal class I was teaching, nobody would show up, and I would be able to go outside. OK. <laughs> Are we talking about a new learning paradigm or not? And let me give you a little bit of background about me. Uh, as I mentioned, I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington, majored in psychology, ended up focusing on the area of learning, and went to graduate school at the University of Notre Dame. Now, that talk about a cultural shock. Okay, talk about a cultural shock. Anybody here from statistics? Do we have the? OK. Well, let me tell you about the very first statistics class that I walked into as a graduate student at the University of Notre Dame. Um, you know, I came from uh, you know, a pretty large public university like this. And then we all sat down that first day of statistics. And in walks Father Boatsum. OK, Father Boatsum is the statistics teacher. And then he says, uh, welcome, new students. I like to begin every statistics class with the Lord's Prayer. And um, man, I mean, I, this is, I'm a Jewish kid from Seattle. This was really, this was culture shock. And I also knew it was statistics, so maybe prayer was in order. But uh, uh, that I realized I was in a different place. So those memories of that very first class. OK, so if you'd all join me in the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> our Father. Oh, oh sorry. Um, so my back. <laughs> I got struck by lightning a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> so for a while at KI, we, we were missing a vice president of our education markets. And I stepped in because we were delivering a lot of continuing education courses. And I thought, well, you know, there's kind of an overlap here. It's learning. It's higher education. I'd, obviously done adjunct teaching and teaching as a, as a TA and, um, and was, in, was interested in, in learning and learning processes. And so as I delved into the literature that was popular and, uh, and primarily referenced in the design area, I ran across articles like From Teaching to Learning, A New Paradigm for Undergraduate Education, published in 1995. And for some reason, that reminded me, at least the title, of an article that I had heard of and read, read a long time ago. Gee, what do you know? B.F. Skinner, uh, The Science uh, of Learning and the Art of Teaching from 1954. So when we talk about a new paradigm, 
I looked at that and said, geez, is this really a new paradigm? Or you know, are we repeating history? Or is this, oh, has this been a challenge? Which is what I contend. It's been a challenge for a lot of us who have been striving to improve educational processes and, uh, and education in, higher, in, uh, in the higher education uh, domain. So what I'd like to do is just, first of all, ask you just to get your goals. Just, and maybe some of you have seen this. This actually was published uh, by a professor from UC Berkeley. Um, it was a survey. And uh, it's an exercise for faculty, and in this case, staff also. What of those six items do you see as the primary function, primary role of teaching in a college or university? You can make a mental note. If you have notes, you can actually circle it. That would be active. <laughs> but I trust you can remember. Okay. We have higher order thinking skills, facts and principles, jobs and careers, student development, basic learning skills, and to be a role model. Okay. So everybody have that uh, idea in their head? Yep. Ready? Let's see. What do we have here? Here are some data that reflect the perceptions of uh, faculty from various departments and schools within the university. Now, I point out a couple of interesting things, facts and principles. Uh, for example, English and medicine, which is a little scary, didn't see facts and principles as important as virtually every other discipline. And uh, in medicine, higher order thinking skills fell low on the uh, uh, list of priorities, too. Think about that next time you go to see your physician. Okay. Um, jobs and careers was the primary function as they perceived it. So what this tells us is that the goals of faculty, staff, the goals of the educational process differ. Uh, differ across different domains, different departments, different specialties, different areas. So we have to take that into account when we consider uh, our pedagog pedagogical approaches, and also even design. Um, for those of you who have an educational psych background, uh, there has been a lot written about various goals of education. And one of the most cited taxonomies of educational goals is Bloom's. And this is from 1956, but you know, it just seems to persist. And so if you're so it, it may be 56, but it's still good today. And essentially uh, delineates from lower order thinking to a higher order thinking process uh, the various outcomes. And it also dictates, in some sense, the ways one might demonstrate or measure competencies at those various levels. So one hand, we have the faculty and staff, have, and then we have these goals. So there are some goals. And I think it's a good idea to start out with the goals of education. And, um, and then how do we accomplish those goals? Well, I think some of us have seen these data. And um, you know, how are we going to accomplish the goals? And if we look at these variety of ways that we have uh, delivered information, provided education, uh, we can see that there's a whole group of passive techniques that we've relied on for years. Um, reading and lectures and other passive, watching demonstrations. Very passive techniques. And this probably, uh, this has been around, this uh, visual and uh, audiovisual methods in teaching. But what we see here is that we have uh, retention that varies significantly when the instructional design is much more active. In fact, just participating in a discussion or giving a talk, uh, we're more likely to remember up to 70% of what it was that uh, we were to learn. Okay. And you know, coming from business, where I work a lot with um, salespeople, and uh, they, you know, they're, they're, well, I guess they're people like students, sort of. Um, but we find we have to be very active because uh, the attention span issue uh, with, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult you guys over there. Uh, salespeople have attention spans that are measured. I know, yeah, I know, you were, that's right. You were doing something else, that's right. You're on your Blackberry, you know. Um, 
Um, so we have to make sure, I have to make sure that, that, uh, that whatever instruction I design is, is active, otherwise I can lose the audience really quick. Uh, but 90% of what we, we say and do will remember two weeks later if we do it. So in terms of the kind of instruction that I've been involved in, we do what? Nothing but role plays and nothing but demonstrations because we know, A, that's going to keep the students awake, and B, it's the most likely to achieve the retention that we need. Now, my buddy, B.F. Skinner, he has another view of education. This might be more accurate. Um, it's what's left over after everything else is forgotten that we learned. Yeah, so. Sure. So, I mean, how, how about, do you have any sense of how much content we get in the other medium? So, I mean, I read a lot more than I talk. Yes. So, I probably read 100 times more than I talk. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, I don't have percentages. Um, in terms of delivery methods, I think, you know, in terms of educational delivery methods, we probably have to all agree that lecture and reading are the two techniques that we depend on most, and um, those are the top two least, reten re least retained level. But if, but if I read a lot more content? Yeah. If you read, yeah, it, it's just that you won't, the retention right. is not going to be as great. I mean, that's. But the total information I retain can be greater. Oh, I see, from an absolute perspective. Right. Yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you look at the absolute, it's very possible. But you know, given that we only have so much time, that's the other constraint that we have in education is that we only have so much time, and, and in fact, that's one of the challenges that we have uh, is that the measures of education are in chunks called quarters and semesters. So you can only read so much. So yeah. So unlimited reading, absolutely, no doubt about it. Any other questions? Okay. This research uh, in learning goes way back. And when I first became involved in talking a little bit about learning and the impact of learning processes on class design, instructional design, uh, the design of learning environments, um, I first thought of people like uh, Fred Keller, who uh, in, in his memoirs, documents that in 1938 he was investigating active learning approaches by adding those to his lecture in Columbia. And he was, of course, psychology became very prominent at, after World War II, after a lot of the psychometrics and, uh, and, and other things that psychologists were doing. And so post-World War II uh, and World War I, um, uh, Keller was involved in a lot of signal core research where people said learn, you know, code. And so he designed the learning. Well, the learning didn't contain much in the way of lectures. It was all very active. A lot of peer instruction. And that goes back to 1942. And in the early 40s, he even supplemented his psych classes with various active uh, learning techniques like experiments. So in some sense, this isn't new. Uh, and Keller's personalized system of instruction, which entails chunking information up and putting it into sequences of delivery with students demonstrating mastery that is active, has been well established as a technique uh, for many years, and we still use it today. And uh, of course, there's been other research, and, and McKeechee has documented a lot of this other research. Older, this is kind of a historical background, but in 49, uh, there was some research on student-centered instruction, finding it's much more effective than lectures and uh, independent study initiatives in the 60s. Some of you may be, uh, I certainly remember the independent study initiatives in the 60s, both in high school and uh, as I went to college. That was a big deal at the time. And, uh, and then there's cooperative learning cells with uh, kind of a European approach uh, that uh, entails oh, not quite a learning community, but, but learning in groups. Okay? So these things are things that have been around a long time and just give you a little bit more early research. These are some things. These are some quotes from B.F. Skinner. Um, and, 
Anybody know anybody in those pictures? No. Uh, Skinner Hughes. This is what he said. Now, actually, this is from his book in 1973, but he actually said this earlier. He said, well, gee, the modern classroom doesn't offer much evidence that research in the field of learning has really been applied. Gee, what a surprise. What a surprise. Uh, instruction does not incorporate enough positive reinforcement, immediate positive reinforcement. So right away, the design of the learning process and the learning techniques are deficient because some of the very basic learning principles are not being well applied. Uh, learning can be supported with the help of, and this is the early 50s, uh, the mechanical device. And at that time, he was talking about the teaching machine. But you know, this is technology. That was technology then. And uh, learning's best when instruction follows an optimal sequence. Gee. So Skinner was pretty uh, prophetic when it comes to some of the approaches that we're adopting now and a teacher's job. What do you know? Is to design and create conditions which optimizes learning. Okay. So we haven't moved a lot uh, further from this perspective, but it's coming back, perhaps iterating back in a different way. Uh, some of you may remember computer-based training, okay, or Plato. The old Plato research from the University of Illinois in the 60s. And so all of those were some of the technology uh, approaches that were uh, utilized to enhance learning uh, and have been addressed many years ago. Now, let's fast forward. Where are we now? Well, it's not just psychologists that are doing research and learning. What we found is, and this is what I've discovered, and I actually feel pretty guilty about it. It wasn't, it's not psychologists, it's not the field of psychology, it's not the field of learning psychology that seems to have taken uh, the, the concern that we have about education and started translating it and start translating it into applied approaches where we can enhance education. So I feel really bad that it's been physics, it's been statistics, it's been, um, it's been math areas, engineering. Those are the classes that have, in fact, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington, we had uh, an experimental class, and it was sponsored by the department. Uh, of, it was the physics area. Okay, so we we've been overshadowed. Psychology has been overshadowed, and so I feel really bad about that, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, what we see as we move forward: a lot of focus on groups, small groups, large groups. Um, Buzz groups is an example of, uh, of a case where an instructor might say, turn to your neighbor and discuss something. Okay, just real quick. Uh, problem analysis groups, peer instruction groups, more peer instruction. But if we go back and, uh, and we look at what Keller was doing in 1942, eh, there's some peer instruction there too. Groups and individual activities, another approach to active learning. Um, writing projects, another approach to active learning, reports, literature reviews, those sorts of things. These are all approaches that engage the student beyond the traditional test and multiple choice exam. Uh, presentations and panels, independent studies, internships, practica, those sorts of things are active learning examples. Okay. And the goal, of course, is to incorporate more and more of those as much as we can into our approach to education. And um, the, the, the team-based approach can be subdivided. And we can subdivide a lot, and I don't want to get into too much detail. But there's really a continuum of team-based approaches to, well, we use teams once in a while, to we, uh, teams are integral. Teams are a part of the educational process. So um, interestingly, Larry Michelson, uh, uh, claims that he originated this whole notion of team-based learning. Um, of course, this is a self-citation, but be that as it may. Um, but he also applied it to business. But this is a basic application of just uh, team-based problem-solving teams and discussion teams. And, but the next step really is, as opposed to those eh, semi-formal, to these cooperative learning groups, uh, where it's more frequently integrated into lectures. And um, usually these are groups of uh, two, three, four people that are given a problem or an issue to discuss. And it's part of a traditional lecture-based course. 
Uh, at the other end of the continuum, at the far end of the continuum, are learning communities. Some of you are no doubt familiar with some of these learning communities that are um, evolving in various universities where students actually reside. The residence halls are actually involved in putting together or supporting learning communities in a particular, series, in a particular set of disciplines or a discipline. Um, so it's a group of students pursuing a field of study that don't just take the same classes, but they may actually live in the same dormitory. So the experience is maximally enriched. Okay. So that's the continuum from informal uses of teams and groups to very, very formal uh, learning communities. Now there are some challenges to teaching small groups. Some of you may have encountered some. Anybody tried teaching small groups? What are some of the challenges that you've encountered? Don't stay on task. Isn't that funny? They uh, get together, and uh, for some reason they're talking about something else. Okay, so they don't stay on task. Other other challenges. Equal participation. That's a real good one. That's a great segue, too. Um, how many are familiar with uh, Bib Latinae's social loafing research? Uh, it actually goes way back to a guy named Max Ringelman or something in 1913, but here's the study. Uh, an individual is blindfolded and told that they're playing a, a game of tug of war. And um, they're told uh, that uh, they are pulling the rope by themselves, they're blindfolded, and what they do is they measure the force uh, with which they're pulling the rope. Then they're told that they're now pulling with one other person. Then they're told they're pulling with two other people and three other people, and four other people, up to five other people. Now, what you see here is the amount of uh, effort uh, as it changes when they are told how many people are, they're, they're pulling with. So as they're told they're participating with more and more people, their effort declines. We call that social loafing. And I think it addresses <laughs> the point that was just made, and that is, yeah, people working in groups, and let's face it, I don't know, when I was in a group, I always wanted to surround myself with the people that would do the work. So that seems to be a natural, that is a challenge. So how do, how do you control for the effect of social loafing? Um, the instructor may have a hard time controlling themselves, because of course, they're, they have a habit. Uh, one student dominates. That's very typical too, you get a dominating student. Um, stone, students don't prepare, they show up. Um, students can't be encouraged, but they just only want to respond to questions. They just want to respond to questions. You know, they've been conditioned through, what, 12 years of education. In many cases, they come to college and if they're confronted with a new technique or, or the requirement to participate, that may be totally foreign. They're used to a paradigm. And students uh, want to be given the solutions to problems. And I recall being in some discussion groups where we say, geez, why don't they just give us the answers? Why are we discussing this stuff? Uh, they know what the answer is. This seems to be silly. Okay? We've all been there. Okay? So that's another one of the things that's happened. So we've seen some improvement initiatives, or initiatives to improve the quality of education, taking active learning principles and other principles of learning, and uh, some nationwide applications that have been uh, really quite, quite impressive. One is the Scale Up Project. Uh, are some of you familiar with Scale Up? Okay, familiar with Scale Up? Student-centered activities for large enrollment undergraduate programs. Now, originally, the, the P stood for physics. It started out as a physics class improvement. Not a site class. I should say it was a site class, but I can't say it was a site class. But it has its roots in North Carolina State University, uh, where uh, some of the initial research was done, primarily with uh, engineering, mathematics type, type students. And, um, and in fact, there's still a physics education research literature out there. In fact, you can still see the term per or per faculty people who have adopted this approach, faculty that have adopted this approach. 
Um, the primary goal of the scale-up project was pretty obvious. It was to establish much more collaboration in the classroom, uh, to uh, ensure that technology was available to the students to enhance the educational experience. Um, also, what ScaleUp sought to do was to demonstrate that these collaborative, these active learning approaches could be introduced into large classes. Because up till this point, it was done in pretty small classes. And so it was easy to argue that, well, those techniques work, but you got to have a class of 20 people or 30 people, or you can do it in a seminar. Okay. So scale up was, and I think one of the biggest contributions of scale up was to show that you can apply active learning to large classes. And um, so the scale up approach, which has been around now for a number of years, has been around designing the instructional design, or the pedagogy approaches, the classroom, uh, the teaching materials and everything to support this active learning approach. So it's a very comprehensive approach uh, that's been adopted and it's been adopted now by a number of institutions. Um, there are some characteristics that, uh, that are common across the applications. Some of you are probably familiar with some of these, but one is that the classroom looks a lot different. It's not a traditional lecture looking classroom. They have what's called a studio or a workshop. And in these studios and workshops, instead of a lecture in a lab, um, it's often very activity-based, but it can vary between a lecture, uh, between uh, lectures and experiments and discussions and all sorts of different activities. The, the room is flexible enough and has been designed to facilitate those kinds of, uh, those kinds of instructional activities. Um, and typically they're in two hour blocks. Uh, all the labs and other coursework is arranged. Go back to the sequence. Go back to the sequence of learning, which has its roots, by the way, in the notion of shaping, for those of you who go back to the basic learning principles. Okay. We want to shape the behavior, and that entails chunking up the information in a way that makes sense sequentially, and having people demonstrate their learning before they move to the next step. And so that's another characteristic of the scale-up approach. Uh, group activities obviously encourage collaboration. Teachers are more coaches and work the audience, so to speak. They work the classroom. They coach, help people solve problems, but don't necessarily solve the problems for the students. Lectures are minimized. Activities are maximized. Uh, teachers, like I mentioned, they act as coaches. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it is a different approach. And uh, I think the fact that this is being adopted, finally, after uh, 1942, 60, uh, uh, we're finally seeing after 70 years, <laughs> and, uh, really, a systematic application of these techniques and how great it is. There is another initiative called the National Survey of Student Engagement. Some of you must be familiar with that too. I presume you participate or no? No? Yeah? yeah. No? has a thing called which is very similar to Similar to the, OK. It's different, but OK. Uh, this is another, this is another uh, uh, group that is gathering information, benchmarks uh, from in this case, uh, hundreds of universities and colleges. And what they do is they collect the information, and then they provide the participating institution where they conduct these surveys. They, they provide them a, a lot of reports. And if you're interested in NSSE, go out to their website, and you can be overwhelmed with all the different reports that they have and all the different kinds of uh, instruments that are available. They also have a faculty survey of student engagement. and so. Complementing scale up, here's another initiative to promote better approaches, more effective approaches to learning that naturally focus a lot on active learning and techniques that are based on the principles and laws of learning. Uh, this is an example of, for example, uh, this is an example of a report that might be provided uh, to a university that compares 
how they do on the various factors, and uh, to a select group that they would select, to benchmark groups, to the best. 300, almost 400,000 students have participated in this. Um, in fact, in 2010, 336,000. Um, 2.7 million have completed the survey since the 2000. So, pretty well established survey. And really good feedback for the uh, organization. But like any survey, it's only good if you do something with the data. Okay? You got to do something with the data. Otherwise, it's just another report. Student engagement. Now, I'm always concerned about how operationally defined some of these terms are. So when I look at things like student engagement, my question is, well, what does that mean? What is student engagement? Well, they've defined it, and that is the amount of time that uh, students put into their studies. And also, it's a measure of how the institution deploys its resources to support that learning. So there are a series of questions that cover those those, made, those two major factors that define student engagement. And the benchmark factors are the level of academic challenge, um, student-faculty interaction, enriching educational experiences, active and collaborative learning, and supportive campus environment. So the NSSE provides organizations, provides institutions with feedback about how well they're doing on those five key factors. Uh, Another sub-research uh, project by NSSC is the DEEP, uh, which stands for Documenting Effective Educational Practices. It's DEEP Educational Practices. It's Educational Practices really by 20 exemplary institutions against which one can be benchmarked. Okay, so they've, they've delved into it even more deeply to try to uh, art, uh, articulate um, and specify what are the factors that differentiate those institutions that have highly engaged students from those others. Okay. Their website, the NSSU website, website, it's filled with a lot of really great information. Another movement is EDUCAUSE. Remember with EDUCAUSE? It's more technology oriented, but they too have adopted a philosophy that uh, goes beyond technology and uh, their goal is to identify um, uh, the intelligent use of information technology, but also they get involved in instructional design and other factors that uh, promote effective learning. And in fact, they have a group that's essentially the uh, EDUCAUSE Learning Initiative. So a subgroup within EDUCAUSE is really preoccupied with things like uh, how do different learner populations differ? How does the so-called net generation differ from the older student? Uh, what about learning principles? And, um, and this is where they get into things like instructional design, learning space design, and then finally learning technologies. A lot of mobile learning technologies um, are areas of investigation uh, for them. Uh, other emerging technologies, games, simulations, all of those things EDUCAUSE is focusing on on ways to incorporate those into the educational environment to augment so, and, and enhance learning. So I urge you, if you're not familiar with EDUCAUSE, check them out. They have a lot of uh, literature out there, too. So what are some of the outcomes of active learning? As a researcher myself, I'm interested in knowing whether or not this stuff works. And because to me, that's the real test. Are we seeing improved learning outcomes? And uh, something above and beyond uh, just the good feeling one might have from being in a really nice brand new classroom. Okay. Are we seeing some? Well, here are some of the anecdotal uh, bits and pieces of information that I've been able to dig up. One is we see, like, uh, we see considerably more faculty interaction. Active learning results in increased faculty interaction, which is interesting because uh, it's almost counterintuitive because you're asking for more interaction from the students, but it's mutual. Okay? There's more responsibility to the students to take an active role in their own education. Um, there's much more self-direction by the students 
in an active learning approach. Um, there's a lot more inter interdependence, interdependence among students. Students will help other students succeed. And if the groups are designed properly, <laughs> if the incentives for the groups are designed properly so that all the group members benefit when everybody in a group does well, then you'll see even better independence. That's all part of the learning design. That's how you get around some of those challenges that we talked about with, with uh, groups. Uh, more comprehensive understanding. So we see better scores on tests and written materials and, and uh, indicators of comprehension with, uh, with, with students who have been through active learning experiences. Uh, fluency in expressing ideas uh, related to the areas. Those are, again, anecdotal, but we see that. And uh, higher order cognitive skills. People are, uh, students especially, are able to not only articulate, but uh, actually uh, go the next step and synthesize information and develop hypotheses and, and test them and things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a traditional lecture course. That's a busy slide, but sorry. This is <laughs> the NSSE data. As I mentioned, I'm interested in data. I'm interested in knowing whether or not this stuff works. Well, NSSE has done a predictive validity study to check and see whether or not there is a relationship between scores on the NSSC uh, instrument and results. So first year GPA. Turns out that students, first year students, do indeed uh, do better in those schools that have a higher uh, NSSE score. That's good, statistically significant. Uh, first year persistence, that is they stick around for the second year. There's evidence that suggests that schools that adopt these approaches that are defined by the NSSE, there's clear evidence that students persist. They stick around for the next year. So retention is enhanced. Uh, senior year, GPA, um, it was small, but it was still positive statistically. So there was still, uh, for seniors, a significantly better GPA for those that had been participating or had been attending schools with a higher NSSE score. So we're starting to see some data support this whole notion of active learning that goes beyond uh, what I call the smile sheets and actually gets to the outcomes, and that is the learning outcomes. And that's exciting but it's incredibly powerful support for the incorporation of active learning within the institutions. Scale-up also has been doing a lot of research, and, and here's, uh, uh, here are some measures, and um, FCI just happens to be one measure, uh, and FMCE uh, is another measure. Uh, this is primarily math and engineering scores, standardized tests, and you can see that the scale-up students perform significantly better at uh, a variety of institutions, North Carolina State University, UCF, okay. um, I think that's Central Florida, U University of Central Florida, um, University of New Hampshire. So consistently across different institutions, the scale-up approach has resulted, or certainly is correlated with, higher scores on standardized tests. And same thing with engineering students. In this case, uh, there were three measures of performance, or three measures of cognitive ability. And scale-up was clearly a significant contribution. And you can see that whether it be UCF um, or MIT, that there's significantly greater improvement in student scores, outcomes, when they've been involved in active learning environments. Now, that's very powerful. So that's more data. There's other research findings. One is that, um, and it's a meta-analysis, so you, it's, you know, it's a lot of different research. And uh, in this case, it was done by Springer et al. And uh, what they found is that there uh, is higher uh, levels of persistence, more positive attitudes toward learning. Um, and also better learning 
better learning and meta-analysis in courses that uh, have collaboration as part of the instructional design. Um, also, Trenzini et al. Uh, also have done uh, some research and they found substantial gains in learning for engineering students. So as we start to see literature that is starting to evaluate outcomes, and we see reviews of literature, we're starting to see, uh, and here's another literature review by Prince 2004, uh, improved uh, learning for engineering students. And I'm not going to get into the, the nuts and bolts of the measures that they used, but the concern I have always is that it be a relevant measure of, of, um, of learning performance. So we've seen that, Bly in 2000, it's out of a medical school, uh, they found that uh, discussions were as effective as lectures. So there's a lot of research out there that really supports the notion of active learning. And so um, we can feel comfortable that active learning is not just a fad, it's really part of an evolution. And that evolution started some 60 some odd years ago. Now, before I move on to learning spaces, are there some questions about active learning or anything you'd like to add? Because I know there are people here that know more than me about active learning. It's sort of hard to know where to start. <laughs> oh, well, let's start from the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. This wasn't really mic worthy. It's, it's hard to know where, where to start uh, in other recommendations for active learning. It's a, you know, it's a pretty big topic. What it is. What are you looking for as far as other comments? Well, have you tried act has anybody tried active learning approaches and found success? Yes. And we, we do it in every course. We're, we're from the CalTeach program. OK. So we work with math and science undergraduates who are interested in K-12 right. teaching. OK. And what kind of active learning approaches have you used? And what sort of outcomes have you? Uh, observed? Um, well, we've used all of the active learning approaches that you <laughs> listed okay, here. Okay, good. I didn't, uh, miss, I didn't miss any? No. <laughs> oh, good. All right. I just and wondered. all of the <laughs> outcomes that you mentioned, both the anecdotal and, you know, more research driven, Great. I think we've observed as well. That's very good. Um, do you have anything to add here, What Nikki? about student <laughs> success, student measures? Have you seen improvement in learning, in student scores, standardized scores, that sort of thing? So a lot of our goal is to prepare future teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, for anecdotal measures, uh, for example, we had, a, we had a graduation ceremony last night and students um, almost uh, um, every one of the students mentioned in their, you know, like one minute blurb about um, why they graduated from our program with a Caltech minor mentioned that there was more community, um, that they had an opportunity to learn in a different way, that they were cool. going to use this style of learning Perfect. in middle and high schools. Well, the beauty is that by using it with them, they're much more likely to take it and use it. Yeah. You know, to experience it is so much different than to give them a lecture about it. And right. Say, I mean, go we ahead we do, definitely yes. model everything yeah. that we are yeah. teaching. Yeah, and that's so, so they critical. can actually see it happening. Very good. Yeah. That's great. Anything and you want to add, Nikki? Okay. Well, that, that's grounds for some optimism. <laughs> Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue. I, I, Donahue I, is I have a answer. question for the CalTeach group. Um, I, I know, in fact, that they have extensive high school experience teaching and also are um, PhDs in chemistry and biology. So I'm curious, now that you're teaching on this campus, what do you think, it, uh, it's my impression that the high schoolers are ahead of us in terms of incorporating active learning approaches in their classrooms. And what do you think is the biggest impediment here on the college campus for doing that? <laughs> I'll be getting to some challenges, but I'd like to hear yours before I get to mine. Okay. Um, I think one of the, big, the bigger challenges is that UC Berkeley students, we almost select for those that learn by reading and lecture, um, because a lot of our standardized tests, uh, like the SAT, that get them here 
are really driven by factual learning. And so I think that one of the challenges is just getting them used to, getting undergraduates used to a different style of learning. Mm -hmm. And I feel that once they experience it, that they can, you know, experience it um, re really at, at its best, they, uh, you know, get sold on it. Um, some of the challenges are the, the really huge lecture, you know, like driven by economics. <laughs> right. uh, but I feel that I mean, we, we don't have a lot of that style, um, or we don't have a lot of large lectures in our coursework, at least yeah. not yet, though many of the techniques that you mention are really applicable in a large lecture yeah, setting I was going to make well. that point that, you know, that's one of yeah. the things that, you know, faculty development, we can address some of those issues. Do you have any other? Other than what he's going to talk about next, which is furniture, because a lot of classrooms are forced into, like we have trouble finding rooms for our classrooms that actually work for our instructors to teach the way they want no. to. No. So I think, but that's what you're going to talk about. Yeah, we'll cover this, and that ought to be uh, an interesting discussion too. But, uh